Hi, welcome to our third episode of Straight Talk about collecting photography. Um, we've done so many of these, and I, I just want to say again that these videos are in conjunction with the written descriptions and close up illustrations that are on our website, which is photographydealers.com. And also, I want to show you that, you know, these videos best for looking at pictures. And on our website, I've written up so many uh, descriptions already of the history of photography from the daguerreotype and the Talbot, Da Vinci, prehistory. There are so many um, written up newsletters that I hope you'd look at in conjunction with viewing these videos. So please check them out. Um, but I think today, since we've already discussed print processes in our first episode and looked at cameras in our second, I think today we'll start looking at pictures. Another ongoing comment um, for our videos has been about what the proper length of these videos should be. We are shoot for 20 minutes, sometimes they get 40 minutes, and some of you have made various comments, they should be longer or they should be shorter. And it reminded me of a story Beaumont used to tell me. In 1946, Nancy Newhall curated an Edward Weston exhibition. Edward wanted 300 photographs in that show. And of course, Nancy knew that was much too many. So what Edward said is, can't they come twice? And I think this notion of can't they come twice kind of gives me a little, uh, a little strength to maybe if they have to go a little longer, they'll go longer. Another funny thing that happened during that 1946 MoMA exhibition was that Nancy was worried about the board permitting her to exhibit many of Edward Weston's nudes. The board was not in favor of exhibiting those photographs and of course Edward insisted on them being part of the exhibit. So what Nancy did, which is what many smart curators would have done and probably still do, is she put many more nudes in the exhibit that she felt she needed, just so the board had the ability to take some out. And by giving the board the ability to take some of them out of the show, they felt better and of course Nancy was able to get them included. There's a funny little note that um, one of the secretaries at MoMA in writing to Edward, and I guess secretaries is no longer a good word to use, I should say administrative assistants. One of the administrative assistants at MoMA, in writing a letter to Edward Weston, um, mistyped the word public, and in writing she explained to Edward that they're not allowed to show any exhibits that had public hair in them. And of course she meant pubic hair. And in return to that letter, Edward Weston sent this photograph to Nancy and Beaumont and said, see what you've driven me to do? And he made this kind of fun photograph of Karis holding the fig leaf in front of her, quote, public hair. Today we'll start looking at images by some of the people I might have discussed, but also I want to try to give you a sense of some of the names in photography and also some of the various interpretations and the way since we've spent so much time talking about cameras and talking about prints. One of the people I'd like to introduce you to today is the photographer Ralph Steiner. Actually Ralph as a young man worked in the gravure factory that printed camera work. He then went on to start taking some classes at the, well, at the time the Clarence White School of Photography which was the pictorial place to learn photography and Ralph was not interested in pictorialism and I think after all of the years of printing camera work he started to tire of this soft focus, very pretty, very romantic look. So he started to basically grow as an artist himself. This particular piece and many of these are contact prints whether they're 4x5 or 8x10 and we've talked about that and Ralph loved the purity of the contact print. This image was the result of an, an assignment at the Clarence White School where they basically had to make a photograph which is more like what we call a photogram by looking at an image where we may not know exactly what we're looking at, which in a way is very unpictorial. 
Um, this is a egg beater. It's the shadow of an egg beater. And in a way, this image kind of symbolizes the direction that Ralph is going to take. It's going to be a little different from the other photographers who are working at the time. As I said, he loved the contact print. And this beautiful photograph is called Minuet on Fifth Avenue. And let's see, it was done in 1922. And you, again, you can see the delicacy of, of his vision and his eye, the purity of the subject matter, and the, basically, and the simplicity of his vision, which is just incredibly pure. Personally, this is one of my favorite photographs. It's called Two Little Men at the Ocean. And we're talking about scale, you know, and be able to exaggerate or de-emphasize scale. That's something that a lot of photographers like to play with. And you can see how Ralph, and I don't know if you can see this in the video, but I'll definitely include this in our um, supplemental information on our website this week. Let me move these off. Here's an image, and I said Ralph liked contact prints, but he also liked to enlarge negatives sometimes, meaning if the negative was one size, you could actually take a picture of that negative and make a larger negative, so you could still contact print, so you could still kind of get that sense of quality. This Merry Christmas image, Ralph made available in two sizes. So again, as a potential collector of photography, you know, sometimes you need to ask that question. You know, you see an image you like at a gallery or an, an art fair or a museum, and then you go to seek it out. One of the questions you want to ask is, is it available in other sizes? Or these days, is it available any other way? Some people print on the same image on different papers, not just making them different sizes. And it's still the same image, but again, it's very two different expressions of this photograph. And I'm sure many of you out there will have a feeling about liking one more than the other. Another thing you'll see a lot of people do um, at galleries and art fairs, even if a photograph is on the wall framed, they might ask the person there to unframe it. Now, of course, some of it, sometimes we want to look at an image under what we call raking light. If you look at the image from the side, we could see if there's any impurities in the emulsion. Are there any scratches? Are there any impressions or mars or scuffs? So we like to see the image out of the frame so we could examine the surface and we want to make sure it's in good condition. Another reason to do it is sometimes there are surprises. We lift the mat on this, and you'll see what Ralph did for us. And again, I don't know if you can see this on the video, but I'll put it on, on our website. He put another image of the whole street where this photograph was made. And when we look at photographs and we start having a dialogue about, you know, what makes certain photographs good or some are not so good, we bring up this notion of whether it's the intent of the artist to include as much as possible or to exclude as much as possible. Now, people feel various ways about this, but for the most part, photography is about exclusion. It's about eliminating the peripheral information and getting down to the subject. I can't tell you how, in all of my years of teaching, I would have a student come to me and, and in essence, maybe show me a picture of a whole building. And I'll say, what is it you were interested in? And they'll go, oh, look at that doorknob. I'll say, well, if you're interested in the doorknob, you don't have to photograph the whole building. And if the photographer asks themselves before they take the photograph, what is it? Why am I taking this picture? It helps us exclude information and get right down to the point. And actually, that's the lesson that Ralph is giving us underneath this mat. But again, if you saw this on a wall and it was framed, you wouldn't even know if it was that that was there. So it's always good to look under the mat, 
lift the mat, look at the surface, check the condition, see the various ways that it might be signed. This is one of Ralph's very well-known images. It's called American Rural Baroque. And this is an image that, you know, it's almost documentary in nature. And those of you who are familiar with Walker Evans and the photographers who later ended up working for the FSA, the Farm Security Administration, making images that both had an aesthetic value and a documentary value. And it's not necessarily a crossover, but it's just a, um, a skill or that a lot of the photographers had, their ability to compose beautifully, but at the same time making a document for us. And another favorite of Ralph's is the typewriter keys. And that's a well-loved image. I, I know it's, it's been included in Beaumont's History of Photography. And again, it's, it kind of brings us to the beginnings of modernism in photography. And you know, as the growth of photography as an art form started to get closer and closer to the more traditional art history growth, we start to see photography get closer and closer and closer to what's going on in the wider art world. It begins going on in the photography world. And again, we've done newsletters, which I hope you'd look at, everything from the Bauhaus to Black Mountain College to the Institute of Design in Chicago. You know, you knowing your art history and complementing it with your history of photography really does help explain a lot about not only the photographs themselves, but why certain photographs were done at certain times. Moving to a completely different genre, we look at the work of the great master photographer of Mexico, Manuel Alvarez Bravo. Manuel Alvarez Bravo was very much a part of the art world in Mexico. He um, was considered a surrealist. Um, when the MoMA mounted their first surrealist exhibition, I think Bravo was the only photographer to be included in that show. When Buñuel went to Mexico to film, Manuel is who helped make stills for those films. So Manuel's work is photographs of his country, of his people, done in a very um, sensitive way, a respectful way, but they all have kind of an edge to them. And, you know, it's that edge that kind of separates him from, you know, maybe being called a, a documentary photographer but they're, they're very much straight photographs, but they all are composed in such a way that rivets us. Um, they're, they're respected by photographers all over. When, when Henri Cartier-Bresson went to Mexico to photograph, he first checked in with Don Manuel. When Paul Strand went to Mexico to photograph, he checked in with Don Manuel. It was his country. He was the photographer, and in this image, how small the world is, we, we see these two probably strangers walking on the street, passing each other by, but we're kind of riveted, and I, now I'm looking at this and I'm thinking of that Ralph Steiner image of the minuet on Fifth Avenue, and we see these two strangers who are just kind of meeting each other. Don't know. It's filled with mystery. He was respected by the artists, the broader art world at the time, uh, Diego Rivera, um, Frida Kahlo, of course, um, Edward Weston when he was working in Mexico, Tina Modati when she was working in Mexico along with Edward Weston. He was very much a part of the art scene and you know, again, the fact that a photographer was considered equal to the more traditional artist is not only a, a sense of what the respect for photography was, but what kind of respect that Don Manuel had by his contemporaries. Bravo was also a master of the platinum printing process. 
And we talked about platinum printing in our very first video. This is uh, something we just put together because we happen to have it. This is uh, mattresses, but in kind of in Bravo surrealist, you know, leaning. Since we had this image, he, which he printed separately as a single picture in both positive and negative. Since we had them both, we decided to put them both together. He did not intend this image to ever be seen like this. Yeah, sometimes he exhibited as a positive, sometimes as a negative. But these are platinum prints. They're hand-coated. And you can see the very different look that platinum has versus to silver. And maybe I shouldn't even use the word versus. I have, um, again, we just happen to have these here so I could share them with you. This is, again, one of his signature pieces. It's called Retrato de lo Eterno. Pardon my Spanish non-accent, but it's the portrait of the eternal. This is the image as a gelatin silver print. Bravo at times also printed this image as a platinum print. And if you remember, when I talked about platinum, and this is the great example, and I'll again, I'll put these on the website so you can examine them closely. I said to you that the platinum metals are more sensitive in the low end, in the blacks, in the shadows. They're capable of holding a lot more detail. And this is it, because in the silver print, these dark areas, they're just black. There's not information in those blacks. Whereas in the platinum print, truth is, there's plenty of information in those blacks. Now, it's really up to you as a collector, which one do you prefer? You know, there's no such thing as, oh, platinum's better or silver is better or whatever, it's your eyes and your taste. Uh, for as many people that I've met that like the platinum print, I've met people who prefer the silver print. So the subject matter, the way it's printed, that has all to do with your collecting. But if you don't ask questions about, you know, availability, are the images available in different sizes, are they available in different processes, it's, you know, it's, it's really on you as the consumer to be asking those questions. Um, some, some people will offer, you know, that information, others will not. In speaking of platinum, one photographer that works almost exclusively in platinum is a photographer, Kenro Izu. Believe it or not, and I think I said this, we know already that to make a platinum print, you need to make a contact print. You can't enlarge an image on platinum. The metals are, are too slow. You could enlarge on silver paper, but not on platinum. Kenro uses a camera this size. It's pretty big. I showed my 8x10 camera last week. Kenro's camera is three times bigger than the one I showed you. And here's a great example. This platinum print, this has tonality forever. And what looks black to you on this video is not black. There's information all throughout this. You can't really do that with a silver print. So someone who really masters the platinum process and really pulls the best out of it is someone like Kenro, who, who I think his prints are some of the best platinum prints that are being made today. Again, you look in, in these areas, they, they, they go on forever. Kenro's most known for his work of sacred places around the world. He, he has many books published of his work. Actually, as all, probably all the people I speak about do. But Ken Rose, um, I think his main interest is of sacred places and, and everything from Easter Island to Angkor Wat. And this is an image from Cambodia. 
And again, um, if you've ever been to these places, you would agree that platinum is the best way to, to share what you've seen because they, the platinum not only you know, lets us see what it looks like, but it lets us feel what it feels like to be there. Um, the brown, the, the, the warmth, the, this ever forever detail everywhere, that's something again that a great platinum printer can do. And of course a great photographer as well. But when we talk about marrying, you know, art and technique, someone like Kendro has really brought those two things together. His photographs are magnificent and his technique, his prints are magnificent. And lastly for today, unless I take Edward Weston's advice and just make you watch this twice and let it go on and on, is I realize, I know I show a lot of black and white work all the time, but, um, you know, Elliot Porter, and I've talked about the dye transfer process, um, the process that he used for his prints, so technically, the prints are magnificent, they're very three-dimensional, they're very permanent. But Elliot, you know, really is the person who we credit of having color accepted as, as part of the art of photography. For many, many, many years, the only serious photography was considered black and white photography. And it was really Elliot who taught us all that color is also um, part of the art of photography. And in his groundbreaking book, In Wildness is the Preservation of the World, I bet for most of the photographers you know, that was their first color book. That was their first book on color photography that really opened up this world to see that color can be used as an expressive part of the art form. Now, Eliot didn't just take pictures of colorful things. He used color in a way that black and white photographers use tone. When we work in black and white, we're pretty much trying to achieve a tone or a full grayscale from black to white. And as many separations as we can get, it adds to the beauty of, of the print. In color, too, you know, how many shades of, of this yellow-orange color you know, Elliot just worked with tonality with his black and white training. So the photographs are not just colorful pictures, they're really masterworks of being able to see a scene and because also of the way he printed, we're able to gather the incredible tonality kind of all within one area of the color spectrum. So when we look at Elliot's photographs, we, we really kind of re, rethink about this notion of color as being part of the art form. I mean, there is some funny parables within photo circles about color, especially in the early years. It was said, you know, if you can't make it good, make it red. If you can't make it red, make it big. You know, these are jokes, off-handed jokes. Um, against color in a way, but I think Elliot is the person who disproves all that. You know, it's not about making colorful pictures, it's still about making photographs. And the image drives and the color just adds to the understanding of that subject matter. And in the words of Edward Weston actually, you know, he said, you know, you try to photograph everyday things in a way they've never been seen before. In a way, Elliot does that in color. I mean, after looking at Elliot's work, when we go and take a walk in the woods, we, we look down under our feet. We go to a place like this is done, and uh, there's an ice cave in Antarctica. You know, they're not just scenic pictures. They're details, they, they bring us close, they bring us to the points of interest, whether it's the leaves that are crackling under our feet, or whether it's a, some grand scene like this, where he's basically ex excluding and bringing us 
just to the essence of the point of interest. This is an image of the aspens uh, actually done here. I'm pointing up because it's outside my window right up the mountain up in Hyde Park and it's Aspens, New Mexico. This is the image that Elliot made on the same day that Ansel Adams made this image of the Aspens from New Mexico. And I don't have the other version by the other photographer. But, you know, the idea of working in black and white or working in color or how different photographers see different things and how we interpret, it's just kind of a fun piece of trivia to know that if these two great photographers were together photographing, that Ansel comes with his version of the scene and Elliot with his version of the scene. So we're going to continue looking at photographs next week. And this is just the beginning, and I think these videos are best for doing just this. But again, in terms of writing up the history of photography, there's 25 or 30 uh, different newsletters that we've written in the past. And if you go to photographydeals.com, you click on the little history of photography button, and they'll all come down. And I hope you could read those and not just rely on the information that I'm trying to share with you in these videos. But the videos, of course, are good for looking at photographs and hopefully I've introduced you to a few people today that you might want to find out more about, maybe get their books or look at their websites. And um, that's the purpose, is just to keep, keep us trying to entertain you and maybe kind of pass on the information to you. We thank you for joining us today. Um, it's Halloween this weekend. Happy Halloween. Please be careful out there. Our COVID spiking. And again, I guess this is the last week I could say this. Vote.